So, without further ado, um, our speaker tonight is Harpo Faust, and she and her friend drove all the way from Albuquerque to be with us. So, thank you, <laughs> thank you Harpo. Yes. Her title is Collections Manager at UNM Herbarium and Museum of Southwest Biology. So for those of you who came to the April meeting, you know what an herbarium is. It's like a library for dried plant specimens so that scientists can look at them, compare them to other specimens, see if they're the same species, start to look at climate change and changes. Um, and she is the person who's doing that. And she was out collecting last week, about 10 days ago in Texas, down at the state conference. Um, so we got to see her there, and uh, she and her graduate student were working till what, two or three in the morning? <laughs> pressing those specimens. Once they collected them, you can't just put them in a refrigerator, you know, you gotta press them and collect them. She's originally from San Francisco. She got her undergraduate degree in environmental science at University of California, Santa Cruz, and her MS in biology, University of Idaho where she wrote a flora of a mountain range high in the Northern Rockies, and she was also assistant curator of the Stillinger Herbarium. So she's currently gonna talk about her work at UNM and also about updating this New Mexico Fern and Fern Allies checklist that was originally done in 1954. Mm -hmm. So long overdue. <laughs> Uh, so, without further ado, Harpo, thank you for being here and telling us about ferns. But yeah, I thought we could start today with a little quote. I don't really like Henry Thoreau that much, but this quote is pretty good to me and I think helps uh, lay the groundwork for a lot of people who don't know much about ferns or people who think they know a lot about ferns. Um, if you would make acquaintance with the ferns, you must forget your botany. You must get rid of what is commonly called knowledge of them. You must approach the object totally unprejudiced. You must be aware that nothing is what you have taken it to be. You've got to be in a different state from common. Uh, just as you know, a reminder that there's a lot uh, we know about plants. There's a lot we may never know, and there's a lot um, for us to learn in the future. Um, but this is a little outline of what we're going to talk about today. And... We're going to start with a little bit of background on ferns, as requested. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so if you go to the next one. So you probably have all seen this diagram before, uh, botanists love diagrams. This is a diagram of a phylogenetic tree or a clade. Um, those are not necessarily interchangeable, but it's essentially it's a diagram that demonstrates our understanding of how plants are connected and uh, related, uh, especially in terms of their evolutionary relationships. Um, and so when we think about kingdom planta, we think about a lot of plants. And so when I like to talk about ferns, um, it's important to kind of put them in the larger context of plants. So at the top of this diagram, we have liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. We know that those are all non-vascular plants. Everything below it is all vascular. Um, if we go down to the bottom where it says campanulids all the way up to anagrade, all of the blue, green, purple down to the bottom are all flowering plants, also known as angiosperms. Um, so liverworts, non-vascular plants, some of our most basal elder plants, and some of our newer plants are down here in the angiosperms. Um, in between, we have conifers in the brown, and then we have ferns and fern allies. If you go next. Um, so today we're going to focus on ferns, it should also cover uh, lycophytes. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is actually a question for everybody. Um, what is a fern? <laughs> Anybody can just like popcorn out their guesses. <laughs> John should know. <laughs> John it's a plant with spores. <laughs> a plant with spores. You can go to the next one. That's good. It is a plant. Okay. That's good. So if it has spores, what does it not have? Seeds. Seeds. If it doesn't have seeds, what else does it have? It doesn't have flowers. Yeah, so you can keep going to the next few. Oh, and uh, if it has any type of, uh, if it has either a seed, a spore, or a flower, we know it's what type of plant? No. A vascular plant. You should know that, John. <laughs> These are also just like, just to kind of keep you on your toes and remind yourselves of the larger classifications of plants. But yeah, you can keep going. So a fern is just a plant. It's a vascular plant. It's a vascular non-flowering plant. You can keep going. 
It's a vascular non-flowering seedless plant. And most importantly, it's a vascular non-flowering seedless spore producing plant. And there's many ways that those spores can come in different structures and different sizes. Um, but just to get us all on the same level, that's what we're talking about. Um, and that covers both ferns and fern allies. So a lot of you probably heard of this or seen this diagram as well in your future, in, at some point in your past. And a lot of times when I was younger, I'd get confused because I'd be like, mitosis, mitosis, this is so frustrating. Why is this important? And on a genetic level, it is important. On a cellular level, it's important. But in terms of getting to know ferns themselves, there's really only two main um, pieces of this that's important. And I think if you go next, it should highlight them. But it's that there's two stages to the plant. So when we think of ferns, the stage of the plant that we're thinking about is actually the sporophyte. Um, and that is what holds the sporangia. Sporangia is one of the many words for types of uh, spores, which are often clustered in sori, that uh, then lead to the next stage of the, uh, the plant, the, sorry, um, the gametophyte. The gametophyte is that cute little heart. We rarely get to see the gametophytes. Um, every once in a while we do. There's certain taxa that show them. Not, so, not many of them do that here. Um, but this is one of the most important things to know just about the, the life cycle of a fern is that there's these two really distinct stages. And we'll talk about it more later. But what it also breeds is this in a really different type of diversity than what we see in flowering plants. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see this is a little peek into our New Mexico fern diversity. Um, and a lot of that is because of the way that at these different life stages, they have to reckon to find life, whether it's in a dry area or a moist area or a rocky area, somewhere with a different rock type or a different aspect. Um, but because of this interesting uh, life history, um, we get to see really cool diversity and hopefully diversity that we don't even know about yet. So again, just to remind us where we are. So this is uh, tracheophyte, it's just a fancy word for vascular. Down here we have flowering. Up here we have um, all of our, our kind of like some basal conifer groups, <laughs> gymnosperms. And then we have all of our ferns and fern allies. So what we're gonna focus on today are all of these subgroups within fern and fern allies. So you can go to the next. Um, as you've probably seen and guessed, you can go to the next one. Botanists like to use a lot of categorizations and diagrams to understand how plants fit into each other. And that is exciting and interesting to me and helps me learn plants. So that's how I like to teach, but you can keep going. Um, so this is really the focus that we'll have today in reviewing plants. Um, and obviously all of New Mexico is not represented in all of fern and fern ally diversity throughout the world. Um, but we do have a good amount represented here. Go to the next one. So um, the most important subdivision within ferns and fern allies, and some people just call them ferns <laughs> uh, loosely, is that there's, uh, in the red, we have all of our, our fern groups, and then in the purple, we have our fern ally groups. Um, and so those, that's the main subdivision we'll focus on today, um, but there's a lot more to this that you could talk about. I mean, you could talk probably like 20 different presentations on each of these groups. Um, so there's a lot to unpack. Um, but we'll start with the fern allies. Um, so um, while we're gonna start with fern allies, um, I also kind of have like a, a pitch that I like to give people because a lot of people are like, ferns, who cares? They're not flowering. And um, sometimes it feels like I have to give you guys some like fern propaganda, which is like uh, actually there's just logistically so many less ferns and fern allies, not just in the state but worldwide, that there is, um, they actually are a group that it, are much easier to get to know if you break them down. Um, they're a little bit harder in a, a state that's a little bit more dry because they make you work for it in terms of looking for them, but in terms of getting to know them classification-wise, um, there's just logistically a lot less. Um, one of my favorite fern writers in the like 1800s, this wonderful lady, Frances Theodora Parsons, wrote that it's actually an easy matter to learn when she talks about ferns. Um, and I like that because it makes it feel possible. Um, so in New Mexico, we actually only have 16 families of ferns and fern allies. We only have 30 genera and only 87 confirmed taxa. 
that's really not that much. And that's actually a surprising amount for a mostly dry state. And just to compare uh, flowering plants, we have 141 families, oh, over 1,000 genera and close to 4,000 taxa. And you guys all here probably collectively know like hundreds of plant families. So <laughs> the fact that the ferns in the state, are just 16, you can do it. I believe in you. You can go to the next one. Um, I also really like old, old botanical texts, like probably a lot of you do too. And this one, our ferns and their haunts is a really beautiful one. Um, but um, just to really bring that matter home, he said, uh, as a matter of fact, ferns are probably easier to identify than flowering plants when one knows how, and the knowing how may be acquired with less labor. So this is also my pitch that in capitalism, um, it's actually more economical to get to know ferns than flowering plants. All righty. So now that I've given you my pitch and given you a little bit of background on their taxonomy, their larger relationships, and a, a dive um, into some basic groupings, we're going to um, look at like a larger taxa overview of all of the ferns and fern allies in New Mexico. Um, but to start that, we will start with the fern ally, or we'll start with fern allies, but I'm going to explain the difference between the two if you go to the next slide. Um, so you remember the slide? Um, these are the two main groups, and I've starred um, within ferns uh, in red are the families that we have, and then in purple for fern allies are the families we have. So in the scheme of things, in the larger diversity, we just have a sampling, but there's some of the, the more diverse groups in the scheme of things. And if you go to the next one, I'll explain the difference between um, ferns and fern allies, I think is what's next. Damn, I don't know where that slide went. Okay, well, there was a slide that somehow disappeared, um, and it was a slide explaining the difference between right ferns and fern allies. No. No, go back. Well, you're ruining it. Go back. <laughs> it's okay. If you just go to this, go to the next one. So fern allies. Um, there's like all these jokes. It's like, what's a fern ally? And it's just a plant that's really nice to ferns. <laughs> okay, it's, I think it's really funny, but uh, fern allies are essentially a group of, they're the, the, the most basal group of vascular plants. So they often have these like reduced structures that look quite a bit different than typical ferns. But one easy way to remember fern ally versus a fern is that a fern ally is atypical. Uh, if you think of spike mosses and club mosses and quill warts, versus ferns are more like typical and leafy. Um, and the cool thing about fern allies is that we actually only have three families, three genera, and 14 total taxa. Um, a few of these are very rarely seen in the state. Um, some are considered endangered, um, but they're pretty easy to learn in the scheme of things. And they have, I think, some of the most uh, unique structures that are very fun to look at under microscopes. Um, so we'll start with fern allies. Um, and we'll just go through, um, I like to do like a family overview so you can hopefully start to understand some of the groupings when you're out in the field. <laughs> okay, so this is one of my favorite, this is actually the oldest um, vascular plant family, the Lycopodiaceae. Um, has anybody here seen the one Lycopodiaceae that we have in the state? It's in Taos. <laughs> well, um, the lycopodiums, um, they have a few nicknames, club moss, lycopode, lycophyte, um, but they're these fun little evergreen shrubs that like to grow in really like high dense organic material, usually in forested areas. We only have one species that's been confirmed. We have some fun records that I'll talk about later when I talk about the process for the checklist. Um, but this species is Spinulum anatinum, it's formerly a lycopodium. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I have some pictures. So um, the green, um, every family I'll go through, I'll give a map distribution of where it's found in the state. And I um, base all of my confirmations on collections. So there are a few taxa that have been rumored to be here, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but just to orient you to the maps, they'll all be collections based. Um, so this is Spinulum anatinum. This is actually right by um, Williams Lake. Um, I'm sure most of you have been on that trail if you dove into the woods and uh, looked at the understory. There's actually a pretty dense population 
of this. And um, that's it, just those two little dots. There's only been four records of this ever collected in the state. One of them is mine from this year. It's listed as a state endangered taxa, which is kind of crazy because I wrote a flora in the high Northern Rockies and it was a weed. I think I collected it 40 times, <laughs> like it was everywhere. So um, it really shows you the difference of what the Southern Rocky Mountains influence does. Um, but the cool thing, if you go back to the slide before, um, it has two types of spores um, and some of the spores you can see, but they're modified into these cones up at the top, which is just a, a layman's term for the strobe eye. Um, and inside there, sometimes you can actually see individual spores. Um, but we can go to the next family. And then we have the Isotaceae um, or Isodes family. Some people call it the quill warts. Um, has anybody ever seen one of these before? No. These are really cool. Um, people are like, what, that's a fern? Uh, <laughs> and yeah, it has like a weird gametophyte stage. It has these really cool like corms of all of these megaspores. And then inside of the megaspores are individual spores that look like golf balls, but also kind of like the co like COVID. Like, I don't know if you guys ever think of it that way. Um, but um, we only have one species of Isodes. It's only been collected twice in New Mexico, Isodes bolanderi. Um, and this is a cool fern, and you'll see like there's quite a few aquatic ferns, um, but it has these like grass-like leaves that come up. And so a lot of people just skip completely right over these. Um, and the same with club mosses. People are like, that's a moss. And we're like, no, it's a vascular plant. <laughs> so keep your eyes out for these. If you go to the next slide, I'll show you some pictures. So these are pictures from Idaho, because I actually haven't found this in the state yet, um, but that's what it looks like just in the water even. It looks just like blades of grass or a sedge underwater. It really likes these kind of like mucky soils. Um, I'm hoping to find it in more places. I keep looking and I'm not finding it, but it's only been collected twice by the same person, Ken Heil, who was a big collector and started the San Juan Herbarium. Um, and these were kind of at, um, like mid to higher elevations, like around between like seven and 8,000 feet. Um, but this has been known, I mean, I've collected this alpine at 12,000 feet before in an alpine lake. I've also seen it like at a low elevation river at 2,000 feet um, across the Rockies. Um, but it's generally favors more of the edges of mountains in terms of its ha habitat. But you can see why this plant's just been completely overlooked. Um, but part of me also wonders, uh, if the conditions are here for this plant to thrive anymore. But yeah, a really cool fern ally. Mm -hmm. And then this next family is probably the fern ally family that you all are the most familiar with. Has it, everybody here has have got to have seen a Celaginella before. No? Nobody? Yes, you have, Mary. Thank God. But these are the spike mosses. Um, they're a very diverse family. They're the most diverse fern ally group we have. We have 12 taxa here. Um, they also have two different types of spores. One is one are these like um, reduced cones up at the top, and then it also has these little stroboli that look like mini basketballs that you can see underneath the scope. Um, but these are kind of like low matting fern allies that come, and they have these like really cool scale leaves. And the whole identification of this plant is partially about how the plant is structured, either on the ground or on a rock for the most part, but the, the scales and the leaf shape is like the biggest diagnostic key to keying these out. And if you haven't looked at these under a scope, you should. <laughs> um, but again, just one genus that we have represented um, and a good amount of taxa. And I have some pictures on the next slide. So you can see that it's actually, we have Celaginella almost everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a lot of the areas that we don't have it, it's probably just because it's been overlooked. <laughs> So it's a pretty dominant uh, group in New Mexico. These are two of the more charismatic Celaginellas that I like. Weather Biana, uh, I collected that one up at um, Trompas Lakes just a few months ago. Um, that one's actually rare in the state. Um, but I've found it in rock crevices of almost all ecosystems in the state, except for like low elevation that didn't really have a lot of like terrain or topography. But it really likes rocks, yeah but you can see that it's been pretty well collected. And if you were interested, say, to then go out into the field and look for this, obviously all of these, these collection points are from a database that I can, I'll talk more about later, but you can also just look up Celaginella, Taos County, iNaturalist. Um, 
and you'll be surprised how many times you've just walked right over it. Cool. So now that we understand a little bit of our poorly represented fern allies, we can go on to the meat, um, the ferns. Um, and something that I want to point out, so uh, as these diagrams show, they show like how are rela the relationships between plant families. And so certain groups you can see are more distantly related. Um, and actually, all of Osmond dailies, all the way down to polypoid dailies, are considered um, true ferns. Um, versus non-true ferns, because we like to make things complicated. Um, but they're just more distantly related and um, evolved um, in kind of different unique ways. And so I'm going to talk about them differently. And I think when you see them, you'll be like, oh, I see why that's not. It's not like the typical leafy fern, but it's still considered a fern. So if you go to the next slide, yeah, that just kind of demonstrates what I was talking about. Um, if you go back, so go one minute, just one back. <laughs> Wait to the next one. Yes. Oh, wait. What's the one after this? OK, so then fine. Go back to that one. Sorry, I'm, I like usually have it in presenter view and could click it myself. Um, but oh, yeah, but true, true ferns, like I said, uh, showed you in that lower classification, are a group of ferns that are the fancy name for true fern is leptosporangiate. And essentially just means that it arises from a single cell. Um, but the biggest thing that you would notice is that they're not, um, is that they have true roots, but they're also going to be what you think of when you think of typical ferns. Um, and it's, again, within the fern group, the non-fern ally fern group, it's just one of the two main subgroups. Um, and there's a few other characteristics, um, but they're not quite as important in terms of field ID. Um, but if you go to the next slide, um, just another reminder, this is, again, our largest grouping of, of plant or fern diversity in the state. Um, we have 13 full fern families, two of which are non-true ferns, the um, horsetail family and the adders, or the adders fern, or some people call it the grape fern family, the Ophioglossaceae. Um, but this is where we have the majority of our um, diversity. So 27 genera, 75 species, and 78 taxa. So this is, a lot of people will skip over fern allies a lot. Um, I think that they're just as important, but this is really um, what the dominance that you'll see on the ground when you're hiking around. <laughs> okay. Hope everybody's with me so far because we're going to jump into family review of ferns. You can keep going. Okay. So now we'll start with this family, which some people don't. Um, it's a newly um, risen family. This um, is the plant family of the maidenhair, which is probably one of the most charismatic ferns that we have in the state and also in the horticultural trade. Um, this used to be in the Dryopteridaceae, um, and it's a, a newly resurrected group, um, which I think is nice because when you look at the rest of the Dryopteris family, they have a little bit of a different morphology. Um, but Again, a very distinctive plant. I could say made in here to most people and they'd know what I'm talking about. Very famous for their fan-shaped, open, clustered leaves. We only have one taxa in New Mexico, Adiantum capillus veneris, um, the Venus hair fern, I think named after Venus. Um, but something that's cool, I took a picture of these, these made in hair down at um, Sitting Bull Falls recently down in southern New Mexico. But something that's cool is that they have this like false indusium. So a lot of people think these are the spores right here, but you actually lift them up and then you have the actual spore sacs underneath with the true sporangia. So some fun stuff to look at underneath. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can look at the distribution. So it's collected throughout, it's known and, and well established actually throughout the state. Um, but like a lot of ferns, needs moisture um, and is known for exclusively growing at kind of like very wet, dripping cliffs or springs. So that's where that has been found throughout the state. I think there's only, I looked at this one, iNaturalist observations versus collections, and there was only one observation that wasn't in line with an already established collection. So it's decently like already been understood. And I think a lot about it is because you kind of can't miss it, you know? When you see that maiden hair in the field, they're like, well, that's maiden hair. It's very obvious, it's in your face. It's not something hiding necessarily. Um, I know that there's been years where people go back to the same populations on dry years where it doesn't come back, but then on wet years, it does come back. So 
a pretty decently established um, fern in the state. And the next family, so this is just one family down. We only have 10 more. <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorite families. Um, has anybody here seen an Asplenium before in the state? Maybe, a few maybes, that's good. Okay, because I know pretty much everybody's seen an Adiantum before, but Asplenium's I think are really the treat of New Mexico. Um, this was a fern that was really hard to find in, in the Northern Rockies, less common. Um, but the Splingwort family, a great, a great common name. And um, it's funny because you read about the morphology of a Spleniaceae and everybody's like, oh, they all have these singly pinnate all alike leaves. But actually, it's like one of those families where the majority is one way and then there's always exceptions. Um, and this was actually taken in the Zuni Mountains during our foray this year um, in this really beautiful red wall canyon. And these uh, two Asplenium species were right next to each other. So this is Asplenium septrionale. It has these really long linear leaves. And then trichomanes, which is probably the most common Asplenium mm -hmm. in the state. Um, but yeah, just one genus is represented here. And, and we have five taxa. Um, Asplenium scolopendrium is our, I think, one of the only endangered ferns on the endangered taxa list for the state. And it was just recently found at El Malpais National Monument in a lava tunnel. And it's wildly disjunct from its other Eastern population, but it's a very cool looking fern. It's one I hope to find. Um, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, it's collected throughout the state. Um, I've found these in really protected rock crevices where there is either, a lot of times it was like behind shrubs and trees or it was like uh, west facing kind of almost in um, like a box canyon style where the, they, the habitat for this area was very well uh, protected. And I've never seen these like in a deep amount of soil. It's like these roots are just barely hanging into these uh, crevices, which is cool. Um, this is Asplenium resilience, which is probably the second most common species. But you can see it's been collected throughout the whole state in a lot of these areas. But one of the most common things you'll see at this map is that it's collected near mountainous areas. Um, there's a few areas that have an interesting geologic history it's also been collected at. Um, so some of those are kind of like, like it's been collected over on the Canadian River and those box canyons. Um, but again, this fern really needs topography to hold it into its place. But one I would encourage you guys to find, and there's obviously been a few collections. Actually, if you go back, um, the other, uh, Rare Texas Asplenium platy neuron, and that's been found. That's that most northern Taos one right below in the Vermejo area up there. Does it, that thing have a. No. No, okay. Um, but yeah. It's okay. It's fine. We go through these quick, so. Okay, and then the Aetheriaceae, the lady fern family. This is another family that was resurrected. It used to be in the Dryopteridaceae family. A lot of people confuse this with Dryopteris, which is kind of annoyingly named male fern, and then this one is lady fern. Um, but we only have one taxa, Aetherium felix femina, subspecies Californicum. Um, and you've probably seen this fern, Aetherium and Dryopteris are also used, I think, horticulturally. But the main difference is they have kind of like these different microhabitat niches where Aetherium is always going to be in wetter areas, almost like close to or on creeks, much moister forests. Um, then Dryopteris can handle a lot more dryness, dry Dryopteris. And, um, and then the, um, they have some slightly different shapes to the frond, but depending on the age, that's hard to see. But the main thing is this is an underside, and those are their sori. Um, and those sori are long and elongated um, comparatively to the dryopteris, which look like these chunky little donuts. But the next slide will show us a little bit of where you'll find it. This one you'll see is exclusively in mountains uh, and in some of the wettest areas of the state. Um, yeah, this picture was taken, that other picture was taken in the Gila and this was taken up at Santa Fe Ski Basin, actually. You can go to the next family. Cystopteris AC, the fragile fern family. This is probably uh, one of, other than Selaginella and Myriopteris, the most dominant fern in the state. 
Has anybody here seen Assistopterus before? Likely, and Tausi got a good amount. Um, they're super fragile, like they're very, it's almost as fragile as like a maiden hair. If you don't press this pretty soon, it just shrivels <laughs> when you wanna collect it. Um, they're commonly confused with woodsia. Um, they have a different structure and shape. Um, also, cystopterus are way more are going to be way more often in rocks and crevices, where woodsia are, are more common to be growing right out of the ground. Um, they also have a little bit different shape, but the main thing is um, um, the presence of these veins that uh, enter into this type of vein called a hydophode, um, which I'll show you later on when we talk about woodsia. Um, but Cystopterus is an interesting group. It's a group that uh, fern expert Mike Wyndham has um, been making updates to. And originally it was thought that we had like six taxa here um, and that uh, what we now know as fragilis actually was put into four different species. Um, and you couldn't tell anything a part of them other than like counting spores half the time. So this guy did a bunch of morphological and genetic work and he found that they were actually all just integrating and hybridizing. And actually Northern New Mexico is like this insane hybridization zone for Cystopterus. Um, but we actually truly only have two infrataxa of fragilis. We have the alpine and then the one that we see everywhere. It's probably one of the most well collected ferns in the state. We have this really cool fern called Cystopterus bulbifera that has these little bulbules. There's only been a few collections of that. And then Cystopterus tennesiensis, which uh, Mike Wyndham just described and is known only in the Zuni Mountains and in the Guadalupe Mountains. And then um, we actually have two genera in this family in New Mexico, one of which is Gymnocarpium dryopterus, um, which people wonder is still here because it hasn't been found in about a decade um, and is another one of those questions of um, will the conditions be, you know, exist for this to be here if the areas that it was found in before have either been desecrated from fire, from cattle development, or climate change? Um, but a cool plant nonetheless. And if you go to the next slide, so you can see this one is very well collected. Again, loves mountains, loves moisture. This is a nice Cystopterus fragilis display. This is also up at Trampus. Um, I, I like how they kind of drape down, but if you were to touch them, they're very fragile, so not quite as hardy and fun to look at as some of the other ferns. Alrighty, next family. Okay, hopefully everybody here has seen a bracken fern. <laughs> they're one of two weedy ferns in the state. Um, in terms of its like relationship as like n n truly exotic or noxious, um, it's more deemed as like a weedy native, um, but they are the biggest fern we have in the state. They're also the hardiest <laughs> um, and they are responsive to disturbance. So whether that's development, um, any type of cattle uh, to a degree, uh, fire, um, just clear cutting, logging, um, but we only have one uh, taxa supposedly some people were at the integrating of two varieties of Teridium aquilinum. This also used to be in dry off Teridaceae, but um, even though it's a uh, Teridium, which is the type genus for the Teridaceae, um, but they resurrected it into its own family, Denistadiaceae, a few years ago. Um, and a lot of the fern work that happened that changed our family group was in 2016. Um, so a lot of these families are ones you probably didn't learn a long time ago. And then the next slide, get to see how abundant it is in the state. Um, and this is a picture taken in the Gila and both on both sides of the road, it's just pure thick bracken fern. Um, this was a logged area that was connected to an area that had a fire maybe five years before. And so it comes back with a vengeance. Next group. Okay, this is a, a fun group because there's some fun genera in here. We have three genera represented in dry Teridaceae. Um, this is the wood fern. Some people call it the male fern family, but I think most people wish it appropriately just call dry felix mass the male fern. But uh, pretty much all of the plants in this group will have a little bit more robust um, fronds and varying degrees of pin, um, pination. 
but we'll review them. This is a, a nice patch of Dryopteris felix mass up in uh, like the Penasco area near Vadito, um, kind of like on the way to Sipapu. And you can see those sori are kind of circular like little donuts. Um, that's a good way to tell it apart from Aetherium, the female fern. And if you go to the next slide, so these are the two other members of the Dryopteridaceae that we have in New Mexico, one of which is Polysticum scopulinum, which is found, again, only in the El Malpais Zuni region, um, circled in the red. It's only been collected once by the Natural Heritage Program in like the mid-2010s. So that's all we know about it. <laughs> Hopefully we find more. And then this other uh, plant that's fun to say, Phaneral flebia, auriculata, um, is only found in the Animas Mountains, in the boot heel, and then in the organs. Um, and the organs is an epicenter of the most fern diversity in the state, unsurprisingly. Um, so the rest of those collections are all dryopteris, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, some pretty charismatic ferns. It's all good? No, you're, you're great. <laughs> so then um, we have, like Isodes, we have a few aquatic fern groups. Um, has anybody here seen a Marcelia or a water fern? These are also used yeah. in horticultural sometimes. Um, this one's actually decently distributed through the state. It looks like what? A clover. Yeah, no, totally. When you pick it up, though, it feels really different. Has a, um, it's... Um, it's almost, it's like as if there was like a really thin succulent to it. Um, I just found it down in the Guadalupe's recently. Um, it has a really interesting little spore carp, um, this modified spore that comes out sometimes in certain taxa, it's like hairy and it looks kind of like a little mini pebble that's attached at the base um, right before the, um, the roots there. Um, when it's in water, it looks like that. Um, but when, you, when it's been in a dry pond, it looks like that pick up top. We only have one taxa, Marcelia vestida, um, and it's pretty charismatic. I think it was more abundant than what I've seen lately. If you go to the next slide. Um, so that was it, what it looked like two weeks ago on our way to the conference. <laughs> kind of sad compared to the picture with the water. Um, but again, loves loves shallow water. This is one I'm, I'm just interested in what it's going to look like long term if a lot of the, the areas that it was hosted in don't have water for as long as it used to. Um, but pond edges, lakes, I've seen it in like gravel, river banks too. Um, but this is not tied to mountains. This can be at a, a wide range of elevations, generally lower, and it's all over the state. It's probably quite a bit more popular than we know. Next slide, cool. This is probably a family you learned had all of the ferns in if you ever took a botany class. <laughs> uh, and it's up until even like 10 years ago what people still taught that all ferns were in Polypodiaceae. <laughs> um, and it has this great common name for the family is the common fern family. Um, but what, we, what is left is just Polypodium, which is the type genus for the family. Um, and this group can be pretty variable, but in New Mexico, we just get these really charismatic, um, nice, like leathery fronds that are only like usually singly pinnate and kind of have these like soft rounded lobes. But one of the most charismatic things about them is they're really large sori. Um, we have two taxa in, in New Mexico. This is Hesperium, which is more um, common. Saxon Montanum is only known in Northern New Mexico from a specific uh, rock type, and the only way to tell them apart is by looking at the spores underneath the microscope. So, if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, this is a nice big patch. I found a few patches up of Polypodium hesperium up near Sipapu and um, up near Trampas Lakes. Um, it likes really big rock outclops, and actually, two of the three areas I found Polypodium hesperium had like what looked like areas that rock climbers used to hang out at because they were such big rock faces and I saw like the remnants of where they would clip in. Um, so I'm kind of interested in seeing long term if rock climbers can lead me to some cool fern sites. Um, but this is where it's been collected around the state. 
Um, I was actually able to fill in that gap throughout the Santa Fe Mountains and the Taos Mountains this year, which was cool. So now we have a little bit more of a true distribution and not so big of a gap. Um, but it's a pretty, it's one of my favorite ferns. It's why I make it my title slide, because I think it's so pretty. And that's where Saxon Montanum grows and actually grows with Hesperium up there, which is so fun. Alrighty. Um, this is another one of the bigger fern groups that you've probably heard of, and we're getting close to the end of these. Um, the Teradaceae, uh, the brake fern family. Um, and as you can see, it's probably, it is easily the most dominant fern family that we have in the state, found almost everywhere. It's pretty cool. A lot of the areas that it hasn't been found are private land and certain reservations. Um, but the, what you see here is pretty similar to what we see of the distribution of all vascular plants for the state. Um, and there's actually seven genera in this group. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the diversity is maintained in this one group now called Muriopterus, which used to be Keylanthes. Um, but all of the members that we have in Teradaceae, except for two, are in the Keylanthoid subfamily. And they're considered rock ferns, so ferns that are exclusively found on rocks. And you can kind of see some of these adaptations to living in drier areas. Um, a lot of these rock ferns can be in dry or wet areas, but they are specifically adapted to drier areas, which is kind of cool. If you go to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the genera, because you've probably seen these around. Um, they're pretty dominant. Uh, we have Argiochosma, the false cloak ferns. Um, kind of looks like if fern was confetti, is like I like to think of it. Has some really cool spores on the back, but really clustered leaves. The arrangement and the type of spores are indicative to the species. We have four confirmed species and five taxa. Um, and this one's I've, I've seen um, almost like all corners of the state. It's a fun one. Next slide. Uh, Astrolepis, the star-scaled cloak ferns. Um, I found this website that talked about desert adaptations. I screenshotted this because I thought it was fun. You thought me dead when I was only dry. I drink, and as you see, I live again. <laughs> um, because a lot of these uh, desert ferns and dry rock ferns, that's kind of what you see it as most of the time. <laughs> Um, that's a common one, Astrolepis cochiensis. Um, for Astrolepis, they, most of them have these long, skinny, tall fronds that are doubly pinnate, and the margins of the pinnae um, and the hairiness level dictate what species it is, and we have six taxa, all of which are pretty charismatic. Uh, we have a Bomeria, which are cute. These are only found in the southern part of the state, um, have these pentagonal hairy leaves. Um, again, found at the base of rocks um, and have this yellow hue to the hair on the aviaxal surface. Next one, cryptogramma. You've definitely seen this around Taos. Um, this one like, goes all the way up to Alpine. This is a, a non-chelanthoid. Um, but the cool thing about cryptogramma is it has two types of leaves um, and often has the former senescent leaves. Um, so these are the sterile leaves down here that are uh, more fanned out. And then these erect uh, stems are the um, fertile portion of the sporophore, which is cool. Um, and we only have one species, Cryptogramma crostochoides, but I think I've seen this on like half of the alpine peaks in this area. It's pretty common. I've also seen it in some of the rock outcrops, but this one in general likes kind of like montane higher elevations. Myriopterus is a group I struggle with. Um, it's a group Mike Windham is working on. It used to be Keylanthes. They're called the lip ferns. Um, we have 12 confirmed species of this, so very diverse. The amount of times I found three Myriopterus species just like in one drainage and was like driving myself crazy. Um, I started actually getting into macro photography and that's helped me because then I can just be like, oh, that's actually, because um, what helps you tell these apart, which are these highly dissected rock ferns that grow mostly in these rock crevices, um, are uh, usually the scales and the hairiness level on the back, um, as well as sometimes the arrangement of the whole plant. Um, but they're very, very uh, strongly distributed throughout the state. If you go to the next slide. Um, oh, never mind, I'll show you. We already looked at that. Um, 
I do. I just was like, oh, Miriopteris. Okay, wait, go back to Nothalina. This one's a quick one. There are cloak ferns. A lot of people confuse them with pentagramma, which actually hasn't been found in the state yet, but they have this like yellow whitish hue of spores on the back. Um, these are always found at the base of rocks, kind of disparately throughout the state. Um, we only have one species, Nothalina stanleyi. Go to the next one, and Palea. A lot of people know these as cliff break or coffee ferns. Um, some people used to put these in Argyotrosma. Some people used to call these Nothalina. There's been a lot of regrouping. But um, the cool thing about Palea is that they, the same species comes out more rounded like this and then desiccates over time into these more linear pinna. Um, and you'll see it coming out of like the same stump. Um, we have six confirmed taxa here, which is cool, um, including a hybrid named after Warren Wagner, who's kind of a fern god. Okay, and then I think this might be, oh, this is our second to last fern family. Um, these you've probably seen, this is actually our family that contains our other weedy fern in the state, the mosquito ferns. Um, I think I'm going over on time. Uh, so, uh, these are another group of aquatics. We have two genera, Isola and Salvinia. I actually haven't seen Salvinia, um, but um, looks like that image up at the top, almost kind of like lemna or duckweed. Um, a feature of both of these is that they have like, they don't really have true roots for being a true fern. Um, they have these very flimsy roots and grow up on the surface. Uh, this is a close up of Isola folliculoides, which is very common throughout the state. The next slide. This is what it looks like when it takes over. But it needs standing or slow moving water. Um, I've seen, this is one that I've seen up farther on iNaturalist that I need to collect so we can get that distribution more well represented. But an interesting group. And then finally, uh, Woodsy ACE, the cliff fern family. If you were to look at that side by side with Cystopteris, you'd be like, how do you tell that apart? Um, they have a few different characteristics um, that um, are hard to communicate to when you're not in the field. Um, but I encourage you to take a hand lens and look at the top of the pinna margin to see if there is the vein goes all the way to the end or stops and terminates just before it. We have five confirmed species. The next slide shows that they're all collected throughout the state. Um, I've seen them on around rocks or ledges. I've seen them at cool environments. Um, the big thing between Woodsia and Cystopteris is I've seen Cystopteris go to much lower elevations and I've seen Woodsia generally mid to high. <coughs> but again, throughout most of our mountainous regions in the state. Um, but I will say, if you go back, I guess a quarter of those are actually Cystopteris collections that are misidentified. Mm. That hopefully all re-identify at some point. <coughs> Next slide. Um, these are them right by side. So um, they have different spores, slightly different pinna, um, but uh, I encourage you to look under scope to hone in on that difference. And I'm also happy to help you further, but I'm going way over on time. So we'll go to the next group. So we have these last two uh, fern families that are non-true ferns, ferns nonetheless. And the main difference is that they have, uh, the, that you could see is that they have these reduced root systems. Some of these systems you can't really even see, um, but at a cellular level that really distinguishes them is that they arise from several cells versus the leptosporangiate ferns come from um, one cell. So these are all of our leptosporangiate groups. We mostly have them in these salviniales and polypodiales, and then we have two groups up here that I'll talk about. Next slide. And again, just bringing us back into that context, these are our earlier diverging fern groups. Next slide. So I'm sure everybody here has seen a horsetail. I hope you realized it was a fern. <laughs> um, they have, um, a few of the taxa have these dimorphic stems. So actually that diagram is the same species um, together. Um, so the earlier diverging portion of the plant comes out with these world branches. Um, does anybody know what species this is? It's the most common. Species. 
It's okay. It's Equizina marvensi. It's like the most common. It's probably what you've all seen all around town. Um, we have four taxa here, but Equisetum arvensi is the most common. Um, but then over time, it essentially loses those world leaves um, and has, and what's revealed are these really cool internodes that have these kind of these uh, teeth that you've probably seen that clasp the stem. And at the top is a strobilis. Some people call it a cone. Um, and that's when you know the fern is mature. Next slide. Um, found in anywhere there's moisture. That's it, <laughs> pretty much. Mountains, low elevations, I've seen it all over. That's also Equisetum arvense, flowing, standing water. It's one of the most widespread plants. It's just, um, it's a very dominant species on the landscape. And I'm sure there's way more collections of that. A lot of people just overlook this. And especially if it doesn't have the cone, people will be like, oh, it's a sedge. Um, and, and the leaves have been dropped, especially of Equisetum levigatum. And I have to be like with the students, like, no, take another look. It's, it's a fern, you gotta collect it. Um, okay, and then our last family of the day. Woohoo! Okay, so Ophioglossaceae. Has anybody heard or seen any members of this family before? Are these also moonwort? Yes, yeah, so this is a moonwort family. This is a special interest group for me. Um, some people call it the great fern, adder's tongue family, but it's, uh, it has, of the 13 taxa that we have, Two of, uh, uh, 11 of them are all from one genus, Botrychium, which is layman's term, uh, a moonwort. Um, and it has amazing folklore dating back to like the 1400s about what people would do with this plant and how it would lead you and it has this connection with the moon and how it would always trip up horses and that's how you'd know where to go amidst the moonlight because it would trip on these ferns. But I will say, I always kind of question that because the picture of these two ferns that's Hesperium on the right and um, Botrychium pinnatum. Uh, oh no, Botrychium pinnatum is on the right and on the left is Botrychium Hesperium. Those are like probably four centimeters tall each. So I don't know how a horse would trip on that. Um, <laughs> but we have three genera here, Botrychium, these really cool moonworts. And then we have Botrypus and Septridium. Botrypus is an interesting collection um, that I'll talk about later. But the distinguishing feature of this family is that um, it has so what you see up there in that diagram is considered one leaf, and it's composed of two structures, the sporophore and then the trophophore. And the trophophore is the leaf stalk, and the sporophore is the spore stalk. Um, and then it's um, on a common stalk. If you go to the next slide, I'm really going over this on time. I'm so sorry. If people have to leave, I really won't take it seriously, um, or I won't be offended. Um, this is one of my favorite groups because they're really weird. They have a connection to, the, to mycorrhiza in the soil. So they're only found in or adjacent to forests, specifically forests that have an established mycorrhizal network. The tree that this, that is the most representative of that in New Mexico is Picea inglemanii. So you'll see a lot in the Northern Mountains. Um, but that's also because there was one botanist who did a flora of Vermejo Park who collected like 100 right there and had a special interest. So there's also a lot of collection and bias to this. Um, but they grow, um, if there wasn't disturbed, say there was like a, a true uh, old growth, they would be in there, but we don't have a lot of that here. We have next to none. <laughs> so they actually have a relationship with succession. So this is actually um, a, a forest logging road behind the fire station up at Taos Ski Lodge um, that I was like, actually, that looks like really good habitat. And I found five different moonwort species right there, just like 20 feet from the main road. Um, so you'll, what you'll see here is that this was probably disturbed like 20, 30 years ago, and a whole slew of young forbs came in and took over the landscape. You also see that's really rocky, really gravelly. Um, so its proximity to the forest means it has like high organic material. This gravelly soil means that it's really well draining. And then it has these young Piceas coming in. A lot of times when I'm looking for moonworts, I like just lift up the bottom skirt of those, those saplings and all of a sudden there's a tiny little moonwort there. Um, this one I found down at the Lincoln in, um, in the Sacramento's. It's the most southern moonwort in, in the, in, or I think in the whole west. Um, that's little Botrychium mulinaria, and that's like two centimeters tall with the macro lens. Um, so it's a cool group. I encourage you to look for them, especially because you guys are up here in Taos where you have a density of them. And you made it. 
Now you know all of the Fern families and the Fern taxa for all of New Mexico, so now you get a little quiz. So, <laughs> based, and it's kind of based on intuition, but also hopefully what you've learned. It's, my question in transition here is where do ferns grow? Now this is a question for you guys. All over here. So go to the next slide. You're right, all over. <laughs> so this is um, a point map of every single fern collection in the whole state and a heat map version of it. If you go to the next, you'll see that with the fern allies, it's not that much different. Um, you will see a few areas of high density, both of collections and of diversity. Does anybody know where the densest area is? Where's that yellow dot? The organs, yeah. The organs are probably the most unique mountain range, but also the most well collected mountain range, um, not just in terms of area, distribution, diversity of plants, but also in terms of temporally. Um, the oldest collections in the state all date back to the Oregon Mountains, too. Um, so yeah, you're right, ferns are everywhere. Um, but more specifically, um, in New Mexico, which we consider not so much in Taos, but in the rest of New Mexico, uh, is kind of a dry state. Um, but ferns need moisture at all life stages. Um, do people remember the two life stages? Gametophyte and sporophyte, yeah. So we have two life stages. Um, so uh, most of these, again, are at the sporophyte stage. Um, so if they need it at all life stages, they, from what I know, only really have two strategies to exist in a drier area. One is to just stay moist. <laughs> just, and that goes for the aquatic ferns. They just, they just need moisture. They're not going to live without it. Um, for some of our more arid adapted ferns, um, they also have this adaptation to desiccate and be dormant until the moisture comes, which is a great adaptation. I wish I could do that too. So if you go to the next slide, we have these two life stages, sporophyte and gametophyte. Um, so if we need water at all stages, unless you have some unique adaptation, um, the, the reality is that at the gametophyte stage, that's the most limiting step of the reproduction. Because if we can't get to the sporophyte because there's not water, what are we going to do? Any ideas? Go dormant. Go dormant. That's it. Well, these are my ideas. <laughs> Go to the next slide. What does the gamete do without water? So these are, to me, what I think of, and within literature, this is how I'm saying it in layman's turn. Um, the gametophyte has to adapt to a shorter lifespan before going into the sporophyte stage. So that gametophyte stage is hopefully a really short period of time. Like Mary said, you can become drought tolerant at the gametophyte stage, or you can just give up and die. Um, so the result of this predicament for ferns, especially in south, the Southwest, is that we don't see them like big, healthy populations like you see in the Northwest, because we just don't have that moisture. And even though we have a group of ferns that have adapted to life here, um, we have a lot of small and sparse populations of a lot of the diversity, and they're often in areas that are just completely overlooked or inaccessible. Um, so next slide. One last quote um, is that uh, this is my favorite, my favorite fern book. This is from like 1890, and it's beautiful. I, I highly encourage it. But she, she wrote, you will never learn to know the ferns if you expect to make their acquaintance from a carriage, along a highway, or in the interval between two meals. For their sakes, you must renounce indolent habits. You must be willing to tramp tirelessly through woods and across fields to climb mountains and to scramble down gorges. That's exactly what you have to do. Um, so in New Mexico, in terms of looking for ferns, I encourage you to just focus on these three main niches, a moist forest understory, any type of rock or crevice of any scale, um, wet or dry, and any type of water, whether it's moving or stagnant. And obviously, this is going to be completely variable at species you see based on geology and elevation. Um, but those are the three kind of habitat groups I would focus on. Alrighty, and now I'll go really quickly through the project I'm working on and then we're, we'll be done and I'm so sorry for going over. So, um, ferns. This is uh, what we know about ferns in a nutshell, um, at least in New Mexico. And this is more from like a botanical taxonomy and like floristics collections level, not so much at a molecular or genetic level. Um, but this, um, 
This is a text that came out in 1954 by Howard Didimer, Edward Castor, and Orr Clark, three amazing botanists. Um, Castor founded, was one of the founding members of the University of New Mexico Herbarium and the University of New Mexico Biology Department. Orr Clark was this amazing botanist and illustrator. If you ever see her scientific illustrations, they're gorgeous, collected throughout the whole state. Um, came out in 1954 at the time, 70 taxa. It was a big deal. Um, recently, in 2020, Gene Jersinovic and a group of uh, New Mexico State folks like uh, Kelly Allred and then also Bob Savinsky put out Flora New Mexicana, but Gene Jersinovic wrote the treatment and acknowledged 94 taxa in 2020. Um, about five of those were taxa that don't have any collections, have never been fully confirmed, and about five of those taxa have been relumped and grouped into other taxa. Um, there's an amazing botanist named Patrick Alexander who worked for BLM and the state for a really long time and acknowledges 105 taxa possibly being here. And then Mike Windham, who I think is probably the best fern expert, um, uh, who actually li lives in like, where's Duke University? He lives in North Carolina. And uh, he recently put out, and so I only have a draft treatment of the new floor of New Mexico that's coming out this year or next through Missouri Botanic Garden. But he wrote the treatment here based entirely on collections, and he only acknowledges 87 taxa truly being here and confirmed. So a lot of different numbers, right? <laughs> Obviously, it's definitely not 70 because we've learned so much in over 50 years. Um, uh, but there are some different perspectives, some different views. Um, and when I saw all of this and was looking at this when I first moved to New Mexico almost two years ago, I was kind of like, I, I want to make a new checklist that's like truly verified, that's focused entirely on collections, and integrates new collection efforts. So that is what I'm doing over the next five to 10 years. So, and I just started this year. <laughs> So this is what it will be called one day, and um, we'll look something like this, and hopefully will be a publication. Um, but it's gonna take at least five years of field work. Uh, I did my first year this year. Um, and so how I'm going about this is in a few different ways. Um, um, and like all, essentially all floras, all treatments, all dichotomous keys are entirely based on the collection. And so where everybody starts is with the collections, and because most collections are digitized, um, I'm actually able to download a subset of every single plant collection that's ever been made in New Mexico, and then I can subset that just for ferns and fern allies. For the whole state, like every single collection that's ever been, if there's something like 400,000, and that's actually really low, poor representation for our state. Like we're a really, I think New Mexico is fourth most botanically diverse, and we are like pretty under collected. So hopefully this inspires you to collect. Um, but for the sake of this, I just wanted to know what we have. So I downloaded all of the records um, from both local and global collection databases. These are free publicly available databases online. One is called GVIF and one is called Sinet. Sinet is the one I encourage you all to use. You've probably already heard about it. Through um, some coding in R, I cleaned these records to clean out anything that was either missed you or referenced, wasn't truly in New Mexico. And then I put it through a package I found online uh, to harmonize the taxonomy um, because if they're gonna say that, well, now we call them Eryopteris, but before it was a Chelanthes, I wanna essentially go through a few steps to say, oh, all of those Chelanthes fenleri and Eryopteris fenleri are actually the same. So I can truly know the number per species. Um, and so what that turned into is a master collection spreadsheet my whole life is spreadsheets now. So the next thing that I'm working through, uh, oh, and all of that, and this is just to give you an idea of what we know. Um, so there's been over 8,000 collections of fern and fern allies. They're held in 120 herbaria worldwide. I think like 100 of those herbaria are here in North America. Um, the oldest collection is actually right here, Muriopteris fenleri, made by um, E.O. Watoon in the Oregon Mountains in 1843, which is kind of cool. The most collected taxa was Muriopteris rufa. You've probably passed it on a hike. There's over 526 collections of this one, which is kind of wild. Um, but then to go back just one, there's also there's multiple taxa that have only one collection ever. Um, and five of those taxa that only have one collection represented our Botrychium and have only been made in the last 15 years. So there's obviously a lot more for us to learn and know. Um, so 
I'll try and go through this quick, but essentially because I have four different checklists of people that came before me, I can take all this data and push it through and see who said what was here and when. <laughs> so I have my list of plants and then I have Patrick Alexander's list, Kelly Allred's list, Mike Windham's list, and the original publication. I can essentially score these. Anything that scores three or four, it's definitively here. I'm not gonna worry about it until later when I'm verifying distribution and checking the records. My first portion is looking about what specimens need to be reviewed and what specimens we should treat as actually here. So if you go to the next slide, um, if I look at specimens that have only been verified by one or two people, that will easily pull out to me, the 40 taxa that I'm essentially focusing on for the first few years. So these are either misidentifications or singly collected taxa or um, a taxa that um, went through the harmonization process wrong. Um, so that illuminates to me what collections I need to review and what species I also need to see where else they're distributed and where it hasn't been collected that it needs to be. So if you go to the next one. so. Um, I'm also just working with really old specimens. Uh, specimens that have a range of label data. Some of the data is like found at this exact location with this GPS and at this locality and, and it was windy that day and uh, I was with this person and all of this information and others like Io Watoon was like the Oregon Mountains. 1843, you know, nothing else. Um, so a lot of it is, uh, using anything I can to figure out some of these older specimens. Um, and so I can do that with updated distribution maps. Also, there's a lot of collection notes from older collectors that are on like um, digital library archives. Um, and I talk to a lot of people. I just email random people all the time and get their opinions on certain collections. And I also just, listen to experts. So I've, I've talked to most of the experts who have worked on ferns in the state um, for hours just hearing their stories and what they think about certain things. Um, and that's kind of the known tools I have now for working through a lot of the historical plants. Um, go to the next slide. Um, and Which is kind of funny because um, there are collections that you think are right. Um, the, the, the ID is correct, it's been verified by an expert, but the label that was put on of where it was collected and when is incorrect. That collector just put the wrong date, the wrong place. So this is Huperzia lucidula, it's a lycophyte um, that grows in the east, it's a huge disjunct. I found out that there's been five people who've also been to that same locality written there and also not found it. So I decided to qualify those specimens as bogus records. Mm -hmm. Like, they're just wrong. They don't exist here. Some people are like, well, it's a valid record. But we know by doing some digging into that collector and their other label data and looking at the dates of other data and where they were, there was no way they could have just been in Santa Fe the next day. Um, then we also have zombie records. This is uh, Botrypis virginianus. Um, it's been found one time in the state in El Mel Pais um, in a moist, drainage. Um, that drainage has since completely burned. I went to it this year and it was totally, there was just not the habitat for this plant. It was only found there ever. It's never been found anywhere else in the state. Will that plant ever exist again? Um, some people refer to these as zombie populations. They existed once, there may never be conditions for them to exist again. So I'm inclined to exclude taxa like that, like the Huperzia, and I'll include that to acknowledge the reality of, of climate change. <laughs> And I think we're almost done here. Um, so yeah, I collect a lot. Um, I've done a lot of field work. This is my first year doing field work on this project. And I use a lot of the collection data in the same methods I talked about for deciphering uh, collections to inform the checklist as also to inform my field work of where I wanna go. I can look at ecological and distribution patterns, time of year, um, and I can also use that to then inform some of the questions and stories that I get. Next one. Um, and along with that, I also just get to listen to a lot of people tell me uh, of specimens that are likely here because they're in adjacent states. And so I can use those same tools to look for those taxa. Um, also, there are specimens that botanists have been reporting as here for 70 years, but there's never been a collection. There's never even been a picture of it ever taken in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can we verify that? So we don't have the tools to 100% verify that. Um, other than just going out and looking for it in the field. 
Um, so this is where I went this year. Um, and a lot of this was like on the backs because I have to mentor, I mentored three students um, in floristics this summer. I had to go to a lot of other areas, so I dragged them with me either on the end or beginning of a trip. Um, so I made about 500 collections, about half of those were exclusively ferns and fern allies. I got a few new localities for a few groups, and I also uh, revisited a lot of historical populations and found nothing because of um, ecological disturbance, largely fire and cattle being the biggest impact on the ecosystems where those plants probably will likely never exist again, which is kind of sad. Um, and in the future, I just hope to keep going. Um, this is up near Vadito. That's my little field rig. Um, me pressing some plants at the end of the day. I hope to just keep collecting. Uh, I want to expand to private uh, land and some national parks. Um, I have to work on my specimens, review more of the historical ones, and talk to experts. And I'm hoping to publish something, even a draft, within five years. Uh, I work full time as a collections manager, so this is not my full time <laughs> project. Uh, that's why five years is a, my generous um, outlook. Next one. Um, but to kind of wrap that up, it's a combination of updated field work and synthesizing all of the collections that have come before me of you know 150 years um, to expand and make this new updated checklist. And I'm, I believe that we can find um, all of those taxa that I listed. So that would be adding ideally 10 more taxa would be great. Um, and hopefully, I worked with scientific illustrators before, um, maybe even make a field guide down the line, which would be cool because all adjacent states have a field guide to the ferns of their state, and New Mexico doesn't. Mm. And now we are, I will end with acknowledgments and questions. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, this is a really cool resource I encourage people to use. It's called nativeland.ca. Um, it's a website and app, and you can tell what uh, indigenous territories you're on throughout the whole world. It's kind of amazing. Um, so you can see that obviously there's a lot of overlapping, but I just would like to acknowledge that the majority of this work was done on the unceded tribal land of the Tiwa and Pueblo indigenous people down in what we call as Albuquerque now. But it's a really cool resource for learning about the people who came before us. And then I've had a little bit of help from other people. Next slide. Um, I got some money from the Plant Society, hope to essentially apply every year until I finish collecting uh, because that's the only way I get this. My job doesn't pay for me additionally. Um, my salary is paid for to go out and collect because I'm a collections manager, but in order to fund this work, I just need gas money. So I wouldn't have been able to collect without that. I have uh, some mentors and a lot of people that like to join me in the field. And if you're ever interested in looking for ferns, just let me know, Mary has my contact. And I think we're done. I'm so sorry, I went like wildly over. <laughs>
uh, an asplenium, and a maidenhair. They both do great. <laughs> and that's inside. That's inside. So I don't know about outside. I'm sure you guys know more about that than I do. But I would just think about the same conditions that you, ha you like would know for a plant outside and how to mirror that. And I wouldn't think of it as any different, but I do think it probably would be a lot harder to transplant. So I don't know about that because you would need, you, you need that spore situation. I have heard that people have had better success doing it when I've heard of grad students do fern studies in greenhouses when they like essentially do some sort of transplanting in like a really moist greenhouse before they transplant it into the field or the garden. But I don't, I'm not an expert, so I'm not gonna lie to you guys and make something up. Also, if you guys don't have questions, I went over. Um. <laughs> what about ages of ferns? Like, if you look at a ponderosa and you say, oh, that's a 400 year old. Yeah. Thing. Are there ferns that have been around for long periods? Or yeah. they have a short lifespan? Or? <sighs> So some of them have really short light lifespans, like, like the, they'll exist like in the soil bed, but like moonworts, you'll never see the exact same one come up each year. And supposedly the lifespan is seven years, but the lifespan is spent six years under the soil and just one year mm. up above, unless it's like an amazing weather year, you know? Um, but I think it just depends on the conditions. I feel like with the hardier ferns, I could imagine them. I don't think I've heard of a fern's lifespan being longer than like 30 years or something, um, at least in terms of the ferns that I've seen around here. But I know that their spores can last in the soil bed for like hundreds of years. So I'm imagining that's what's happening, which is kind of funny because a lot of these ferns are between 380 and 300 million years old in terms of their evolutionary history, but they have much shorter lifespans in the scheme of things. And if you've seen them out, I mean, they have like tiny little roots. It's not like a big, thick perennial. So I think it's their success and survival is really on their ability to reproduce. But that's a good question, something I wish I knew more about. Oh, that's a good question. It, it strikes me that most species that produce spores, they can survive a very long mm -hmm. time. So they can survive a lot, but then would the conditions be present for them to actually come out? And like, when would we see that? I'm really hoping we get an ice age <laughs> in like the next hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just like I see like because these the a lot of these plants have a short life cycle in this in the grander scheme of things, especially compared to like gymnosperms, it really depends on the conditions around it. But it would be interesting to do studies on that, like uh, truly how long each group is able to be viable in the soil bed and what condition of its surrounding habitat needs to be present. I think that would have to be group by group to figure that one out. Right, the next year. Clearly, that's something to bring in the Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, you guys have great questions. I don't have the answer. Something I will read about. Have you ever collected spores and tried to grow them out? No. <laughs> but I've heard of a few people accidentally, <laughs> like, leaving. Okay, so when you collect plants, most of the time you put it into a plastic bag and then when you get to like, you're not in the hike, then you put it in your press. A lot of times I'll field press with ferns and I'll just carry like a modified press for the fragile ones and then I'll do my big pressing. I heard, and, and if you have a big day, um, a lot of people end up putting them in the cooler, or dry back, sometimes put it in the fridge. Um, I, there was this one story that one, this one moonware export, he had a pile of plants and the plants died in and then but he left it in the like back of his fridge and forgot about it and he like found it a year later and it, it had like the dead ones kind of decomposing and then it had a new fern coming up and I guess like the occasional light of the fridge coming in and out gave it some signaling and then it had like similar temperature to like the overwintering so I'm imagining 
that there's a likelihood to this. But they had a whole chunk of that soil. Like it was like a big chunk. So I remember I've like talked to, to you before about transplanting things in the wild and I'm like, I feel like unless you got like the exact, like, you know, with blueberries, you want to get like the acid, I would probably for the ferns look up the specific soil constraints, which I imagine is just like a lot of organic material. And maybe search some ferns, throw some rocks in. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned uh, some species that produce a new plant from a single cell. When, when does the DNA thing happen? So I think that would happen in the gametophyte stage during that, because that's when the fertilization is happening with the like the sperm and the egg, and so that's when the sharing of DNA would happen. And a new plant has been produced. No. Not exactly. <laughs> it's a little bit different in ferns because you have the two different stages. But so I would put it in the gametophyte stage that that would be happening. But the gametophyte comes from a single spore that then essentially is then transitions into the gametophyte when the conditions are correct. I can put up that side, but. Does, is that helpful or? No, no, it wouldn't be helpful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. It's like a fungus. You it's know, some, so some people, you know, used to put ferns in the like cryptogram category with fungi before they knew that fungi were in the animal kingdom because they think of them kind of as like these more basal groups that have really different ways of reproducing along with like mosses and lichens and Blew me away. Well, hopefully you guys, the, the goal is to just get you guys interested in ferns. <laughs>